Hey, welcome in everybody. Hope everybody's doing good and having a great Monday. We are back another week and there was so much good news out today and all of it was pointing to good indicators and things that identified tops and bottoms. And we're going to dig into some of those today. We're going to look at some L1s, some other crypto news, Bitcoin news, a few indicators, both scientific and otherwise, and let's find out where we are. So let's jump in. Um, have we hit bottom yet? Math, money, and freedom, and none of this is financial advice. First of all, to get some news out of the way, when, as usual, I think journalists today want to just have alarming titles and everything that they say. This was from Anita from TechCrunch, and she said, Blockchain's youngest billionaire roasts world's biggest cryptocurrency. It's like Sam Bankman Free just stuck a knife in the back of Bitcoin. But of course, no. Uh, he did, see, basically sometimes things are taken out of context and they miscategorize what he said. I think it was worse the effect that uh, he said Bitcoin is not a payments network and it's not a scaling network according to the headlines that is and arguing that the proof of work system uh, the Bitcoin network uses to verify transactions is incapable of scaling efficiently enough to keep pace with demand. But he immediately came out again on Twitter to correct it, just to make sure the world was not alarmed. 14 hours ago, he clarified. He said, uh, it was saying actually, to read his tweet here, to be clear, I also said it does have potential as a store of value. The Bitcoin network can sustain thousands, millions of TPS, although Bitcoin can be transferred on Lightning, L2s, etc. So again, in clarification, that is straight from SBF. So we'll see. And I think it's... Uh, it would be silly to think that Sam is not aware of L2s and lightning scaling of Bitcoin and the steps that are made in this direction are quite stunning. So it's only a matter of time. So again, be careful what you read in newspapers. Just want to get that out of the way first. Now, this uh, was a pretty cool thing. Big thank you to Sanjay for sharing. This is kind of the ETH versus Bitcoin, this bear market. There's a couple of things that are interesting to note here. One, the distance off the all-time high, 57.3% and 59%. In fact, it's a little less than 57.3% now because Bitcoin just went over $30,000 again for the 10th time today. Um, but here, if you look at the previous bear market 2018 to 2020, approximately, Bitcoin was down, I think, 85%. Ethereum fell 95%. And this time around, they are hanging around the same level. And the bottom is in. But the key is really to take away here, the fundamentals of Ethereum are far stronger than five years ago. Uh, DeFi was an idea back then. Now it's a real thing. So fundamentals make a huge difference. And it's interesting when you look at this type of chart and you imagine the 5x higher return that ETH got in the last run. If that were to happen again, obviously the market cap of ETH could very easily eclipse that of Bitcoin. So <laughs> watch this space carefully. Now, Bitcoin, talking about Bitcoin a little bit more. This is from Jurian Trimmer uh, from Fidelity. His models are very impressive. One of the top analysts in the space. And uh, basically with the current swoon down to under 30K is at 25K. Bitcoin is now below the price currently suggested by the mobile phone based S curve. This is tied into Metcalf's model, and you know, we've done a lot of work on that area. But <coughs> here, the conservative internet adoption, um, all of this tells, I think, the two different lines. Let me get them clear and I zoom in for a second. Yeah, mobile phone users is pink, and internet is kind of the gray lower line. And we are beneath both right now. And all of this to Jurian Trimmer basically says, we are very, very undervalued right now. That is, of course, assuming these S curves are valid and Bitcoin was following a higher trajectory. Now it's deep below. And this, in many people's eyes, is called deep value territory. So another one is obviously the history of seven weekly red candles. Contagion is done, many people believe. Uh, this was seven weekly candles in a row. You can see them there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I think the fourth one was kind of mild. And it'll be hard to believe that this seventh one we are in will not, or the eighth one will not turn green. Again, we did hit 25.4 uh, last week and we recovered sharply. And again, this has never been seen before in Bitcoin's existence, and it clearly shows that the bearish sentiment in the market at the moment. However, uh, 
We have to go back to December 2020 to find the last time that Bitcoin was below 25.5. However, the price bounced so quickly, we immediately almost went back above 31k. We dabbled above about around 31k yesterday, and uh, it's come back down to earth again. But again, you can't keep this thing down for long, so have those sniping rifles ready, not financial advice. Now, another less scientific bottom indicator is our friend Peter Schiff. He is our top gold salesman. And uh, sometimes people believe he's a great bottom indicator when he gets extra cantankerous and animated. But he should check out Jurian Trimmer's, I won't even read his tweet, but he should check out Jurian Trimmer's Bitcoin over gold chart on Twitter. Check it all out, everybody. That's what he should be posting, not that picture. Anyway, another thing is the Fear and Greed Index. We look at this a lot. We're going to talk about it more tomorrow. But the Fear and Greed Index has signaled extreme fear uh, for almost a month, and that was hovering around 10 for a couple of days, which is an unusually long period of such negative sentiment. And the cri crypto market participants are not alone in feeling extremely fearful. Um, because it's like CNN have a fear and greed index too. It bottomed at seven, and that's overall fear, not crypto fear. It's also the most fearful level since the C19 crash more than two years ago. And this fearfulness typically for us is a very good bottom indicator. And the fact that we've bounced up to 12 is not a big move, but it's a sign that things are turning around a little bit, which is good. Now, next, let's talk about this, talk about buying the dip. Digital asset products saw record weekly inflows for this year, not in history, but this year, totaling $274 million last week. Uh, it was $300 million approximately in Bitcoin, about $27 million out of Ethereum. Ethereum is still draining. Can't figure that one out, <laughs> but money's going into other assets. But that $300 million into Bitcoin means these people... Uh, who are investing in these funds or buying the dip. They weren't afraid. They saw it as a great opportunity. So that was pretty impressive. Now, let's talk about this one. This goes into one of the reasons the market is so fearful and bearish, etc. It's about whether or not the Fed has peaked in terms of hawkishness. And hawkishness is the inclination to hike rates. The dovish is cut rates. So let's talk about a great piece in Barron's by Lisa Belfus, I think it was. Um, first of all, they spoke about the Fed, Fed put could still be in play. And for those who don't know, the Fed put is when if the market tanks a certain amount, the Fed will come in and add li liquid, li liquid supply to beef it back up. And people believe that could still be in play, even though the price will be a little bit different. Uh, the credit market is clearly in hot water. The junkiest of junk bonds are threatening a melt-up in credit markets. This is probably the most important thing that the Fed is looking at. They do not want financial contagion. They know we are on the brink. They know the world is highly leveraged. They see the numbers in the junk uh, market, bond market, and it is pretty scary. That's what they're focused on. Not the price of gasoline, not the stock market. Now... When QT starts, when quantitative tightening starts, the dominoes could start to fall, and this could bring about a huge melt-up in the credit market. Again, you start pulling blood out of the system. Uh, it can bring a lot, but a huge set of problems. And also, um, the PCE deflator, by the way, that's the personal consumption expenditure deflator, is a measure of inflation based against changes in personal consumption. That is a big factor. Basically, with all the stuff that's happened, over the last three months, like a fall in consumer confidence, uh, increase in mortgage rates, that's put a huge break on how much people are spending. And that's another kind of indicator on inflation. The Fed are also looking at that. But that in combination with the storm brewing in the high yield credit market could mean that Fed hawkishness has peaked. That's why many, including myself, said, you know, we could have two more hit hikes two times 50 basis points, but after another 100 basis point hikes, then we are on the verge of spinning the economy into financial contagion and also absolutely crushing GDP growth. We are already in a recession, but that recession could get a whole lot worse real fast. And that's why people like Lisa here believes the Fed are at their peak and they're telegraphing it too. Now, not only Lisa... Uh, sees this and I see it, but also BlackRock's Rick Ryder said the end is nigh, not the end of the stock market, but 
the he says the bond market sell off could end in the summer. And uh, he said a whole bunch of stuff. Let me try and jog my mind sometime around the summer, which could be June, July, August in the near term. He sees the 10 year UST uh, potentially hitting about maximum three and a quarter percent, maybe as high as three and a half percent. Remember, we're at about 2.9 percent right now, so we're real close to that 3.25. And he said from there, he expects it to top out and then come back down. And he says he's seen this, we've seen at least 90% of the move in rates this year. Again, also, once that happens, everybody knows once the Fed pivots to becoming dovish again, the markets will rally hard, including Bitcoin, um, risk on assets, NASDAQ, tech stocks, etc. So that's when you want to be on the train, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, it's been a brutal downturn. Yes, it's been a terrible year with Ukraine and everything else. But the end is nigh from all of these indicators we've just covered. In addition, remember, this is a cool piece from Dylan LeClaire. He looked at the Bitcoin supply last active over a year ago. 65% of the supply is last active over a year ago. I actually mentioned this exact number in yesterday's video. And it was nice to see this glass node back up of it today. So again, think about that. Nobody, the people, this 65%, this two thirds of hodlers, they're not letting go. And their strength is at an all time high. It's only going to continue to do so. Everybody knows this is scarce as asset. And literally when people think, oh, there's 21 million of them, it's like, remember, five million are lost and a ton are hodled all the time. So the amount of supply, once the money starts flowing in, price will go up. We just don't know when. Now let's look at the smart contract platforms over the last 90 days. It's been pretty brutal. So if you look at uh, some of these numbers here over the last 90 days, Tron is up 4.49%. The only uh, layer one that we could find that is up that is worth even mentioning. Uh, Ethereum down 35%. Uh, Polkadot down, I think it's 46%. Solana down 46%. Cardano down 48%, Algorand 50%, Cosmos 60%, Matic 82%, Avalanche, no, is that 82 or 62? Sorry, my eyes can't see. Uh, sorry, 62. So Cosmos 61, Matic 62, Avalanche 63, and Phantom a crushing 83% down. So Yes, it's been tough for these guys. Now, let's look at another uh, key indicator. We touched on it before, the distance from all-time highs. Some interesting things to note here. Uh, you can see Bitcoin and Ethereum down kind of just shy of 60% so far. Layer 1's down between 80 and 90%, some down 100%. We don't need to mention who they are, but we'll kind of hint at them in a second. But again, we are in a wicked, wicked downturn. So the question is, what do you do from here? <laughs> it's difficult to say, but uh, if I had more cash, I'd be doubling down. So Silence of the Lambs. This is the self-described Forrest Gump of Bitcoin. He was taking a selfie outside a tattoo parlor in <laughs> in Brooklyn uh, when he got his Luna tattoo. But he's been silent. Uh, he was extremely bullish on Luna, promoting it a lot. He was prolific. A uh, guy on Twitter, I think he was doing 60 to 90 tweets a month in January and February, and then 30 times, 30, 40 times in April and uh, May, nothing, uh, absolutely silent. So anybody knows in PR, you got to get out in front of the disaster. You don't run away and hide and be quiet because then people question you more. So Mike, come on back to Twitter. Just say, hey, mea culpa, made a mistake, whatever. Everybody makes mistakes. Um, but when Do Kwan went silent, when these guys go silent, it's, it just makes people very nervous. So come out and face the music. That's what I would say. Now, another algorithmic stablecoin bites the dust. Phantom stablecoin day becomes the latest to lose the dollar peg. Looks like all of these are targets. Uh, this stablecoin was valued, I think, about $60 million. And it operates with a phantom-based decentralized project. And... Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't operate, though, like the way Luna and UST operated. So Phantom has been hit, but not because of this. If you look at the deep pegging here of day, it is down to about 60, 65, 70 uh, from its all-time high and how it works. 
Um, quick little slide here if anybody has it. But if I do have it, I recommend get out of it as quickly as possible. But while Day is built on Phantom, it does not use Phantom as the stability mechanism. And it has a very complex stability mechanism that is partially backed by Deus and a collection of stable coins unified by a cross chain bridge. And it's not the same as Luna, remember that, but it still is vulnerable. Once these algorithmic stable coins lose their pegs, it could be game over real fast. Let's look at the stock price. This is what a 90% downturn looks like. Uh, you thought buying in a dollar would be good, but it's down around 35 cents. 40 cents from that dollar level. We had ambitious plans of exits at 258, 289, and 329. We got close to the 258 one once, but um, the rest is history. So again, a lot of these L1s are completely smashed. Um, so let's talk about a uh, strong dollar illustrated. Again, going back to the US dollar, it's important to look at because this all ties into how the Fed are actually raising interest rates and what's happening in the world, etc. What is the global reserve currency and how that impacts Bitcoin. So the dollars per pound has tanked from about 1.4, 1.45 dollars per pound down to just over 1.2 dollars per pound, which is a two-year low. And the dollars per euro is down near parity, nearly one for one when it's trading as high as about 123, not too long ago. And the question is, why? How is this happening? Why is the dollar so strong? Well, we know the Fed have a lot of problems and the US has a lot of problems, but the Euro is very weak because um, it is very close to the proximity of the war in Ukraine. And that's an issue. Also, despite some weakness and recession in the US, the relative growth expectations are better in the US than in Europe and other parts of the world like Japan, etc. And also relative interest rate differentials. The US dollar pays interest on deposits, whereas the euro pays very, very little. And that's kind of where we are right now. So let's talk about a little public service announcement. MetaMask phishing attack. This is a key, kind of key security alert. Be careful. A lot of people want to ape into NFTs and those types of things. And there was a group that actually paid for an advertisement for a pop-up from some websites, uh, CoinGecko and Etherscan, I think it was. And the scammers were targeting websites that, where people are kind of in the crypto space and they're well aware of what, you know, crypto apes are etc so if you see one of these pop-ups do not connect your metamask it's a scam trying to steal your crypto remember once you connect your wallet you'll be drained and remember these guys are out in force as a general rule do not connect your metamask to any sites that you do not recognize or sites that are not supposed to have metamask functionality like coingecko and etherscan so again be careful out there everybody's out to get you do not trust anybody and in a little bit of sad news, um, we did a hint of this before, but here are some stats that are kind of shocking. Over the last two years, the price of wheat has more than doubled, which is a terrifying prospect. But what's even more terrifying is the dependence on Russian and Ukrainian wheat from many countries in Africa. Somalia, Benin, Egypt, Sudan, Congo, Senegal are all 70 to 100% dependent on Russian and Ukrainian wheat. By the way, the blue is Ukrainian and red is Russian. And all of this is completely disrupted. So I think the world needs to focus and prepare for this crisis, this famine that's coming. Could be hundreds of millions of lives that are at stake. So urge people, politicians to get their act together and prepare for this now. It's too late to prepare for famine uh, three or six months from now. So with that, everybody, hope you like the content. I'll see you all tomorrow. It's going to be Okta Tuesday, which is on chain technical analysis, and uh, we'll check on what's going on in the world. So happy Monday, everybody. See you soon.